today we're talking about the Supreme Court talking about guns. Monetization was fun while it lasted. Now you know how uh, when you have a long list of things to do, you tend to put the hardest stuff off until the end? Yeah, that kind of seems like what the Supreme Court just did, dumping a ton of huge decisions right before everyone started looking at their summer vacation plans. No, I chose to be a little bit of a legal hipster with this episode and go with the slightly more overlooked decision of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, Superintendent of New York State Police. The verdict here is, if you want to carry a gun in public, congratulations, that's now your civil right if you're doing it for self defense. Now to understand this position, I'm going to split this coverage into three separate parts where the law was existing before this ruling, what today's debate was all about, and what this decision actually means moving forward. So first, let's get a little bit of background, because it's going to help significantly in clarifying what and what wasn't at stake with today's decision. Enter one of the most overanalyzed sentences in American history. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Boy, that is an awkwardly written sentence. So awkward in fact that the syntax is at the core of America's gun debate today. Simply put, the second amendment what can mean whatever you want it to mean as long as you have a high enough paid English teacher sitting in your corner. Progressives are going to say, well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, gee, really seems like we're talking about, well, a well regulated militia here. Let's just stop reading the statute right there. You get the gist, right? Now conservatives are going to say, whoa, 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 buddy. No, let's keep going a little bit. What, what was that last part again? Oh right, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Let's focus a little bit more on that latter half. Is the goal at the end of the day a well regulated militia or the rights of individuals to be bearing arms to lead to that well regulated militia? This debate was alive and well in the groundbreaking 2008 Supreme Court case of DC vs Heller, which set the stage perfectly for today's debate. Now this decision was maybe 10% legal analysis and 90% grammatical studies. You see conservatives came out swinging with, well you see the operative clause as the right of the people and the perfunctory clause as the well regulated militia. And the progressives fought back with their own term and their own English teacher saying, screw your clauses. How we should really read this amendment is in three separate parts. You see, you got the introductory language over there. We're defining the amendment's purpose, that of course being the well regulated militia part. And then you got the rest after that. Now, one side, well, they were putting all the emphasis on the militia requirement, just putting that whole thing in bold, while the other side was putting all the emphasis on the individual rights part of the sentence. This incredibly drawn out and whew, pretty boring grammatical debate concluded in a 5 4 2008 majority deciding to take the clause approach to interpreting the Second Amendment. Exciting, I know! But for the first time in United States history, they found that the Second Amendment actually, first and foremost, protected an individual's right to keep and bear arms. Individuals officially had a constitutionally protected right to bear arms beyond membership and militia, placed right there next to freedom of speech and freedom of the press on the civil rights shelf. Now with this 2008 legal reinterpretation, the state's ability to regulate gun possession was incredibly limited. Now of course there was this very large, very ambiguous asterisk just hanging over this whole decision. Where are we going to draw the line? Does like everyone have the right to bear arms? I mean violent ex-convicts have first amendment and fourth amendment rights, do they all of a sudden have second amendment rights as well? <clears throat> I'd like to speak to my lawyer and I'd like a 30 odd 6. Now two separate rules were created. First, home defense. 
You see, the Second Amendment was found to protect an individual's right to protect a firearm unconnected with service to a militia and to use that firearm for traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. So alright, that was a huge win for civil rights advocates because it meant that states were incredibly, incredibly limited in what they could do regulating the manner or type of weapons you can keep in your house. Now, second, self defense in a public area. Now, here the Supreme Court bunted a bit and seemed quite a bit more hesitant. With this decision, the Supreme Court drew an incredibly fuzzy line in the sand. Like most rights, the Second Amendment is not unlimited. It's not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatsoever purpose. Alright, so you don't have an inherent right to every weapon known to man for use in whatever manner you can imagine to serve any purpose under the sun. Glad we set some reasonable goalposts. Now, states, in this opinion, could regulate those gray areas quite a bit. The majority in this opinion wanted to make sure that this ruling couldn't just be used to yank the legal tablecloth out from under every state's noses and bring all of their established gun control laws with it. They wrote that the court's opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons or the mentally ill, or of course laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings. Or of course you can't forget laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. All those laws were still left up to the states to write. So that's kind of how we left it in 2008. We the people, except for a few, have the right to defend our homes with reasonable widely used firearms. But if you want to know your rights are outside of the home, boy do I have a fortune cookie answer for you. You see, the Second Amendment is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatsoever purpose. Hope that cleared things up a little bit. Nope. Well, enter today's case. This is a case out of New York, and it involves New York's law that strictly limits who can carry guns in public. Ah, it's 2022, the sun is finally out, and New Yorkers are looking to get out of our apartments again. The question is, do we have an inherent right to be packing heat when we do so? You see, New York and a few other states have stricter methods for handing out concealed carry permits for public places. It's a two-step process. First, do you have all of the qualifications and lack all of the red flags to qualify for public carry? Second, great! Then just give us a reason why you want to be carrying a handgun in public. The petitioners provided the justification of, just look out the window, it's New York City, I need this gun for self defense. Now the commissioner looked at that application and said, no handguns for you. You gotta do better than just, oh I'm scared of the neighborhood I live in, I need to carry around a handgun in public. The question in today's case is, if you can reasonably claim that you want to conceal carry a gun outside of your home for the purposes of self defense, can the state still reject your application simply because they look at you and say, come on, you gotta give us a better reason than just that. You can defend yourself at home, but when you head outside, well, that's another story. Just, you know, rack your mind a little bit. Give me a more thorough reason than self defense. Now, to be clear, while this case was being debated, plaintiffs legally had handguns in their homes for the purposes of self defense in their home. You see, home defense was constitutionally protected from that 2008 case. The problem, very specifically, was everywhere else. Now, the solution that the court came to it feels unnecessarily complicated. Justice Thomas, writing for the majority, said that. If the law was consistent with historical gun regulations, it's constitutional. Otherwise, not so much. Now, that sounds reasonable on paper, but here's where things get a bit strange. When you start to read through Thomas's decision, it veers off in a lot of weird corners. 
First, we're talking about medieval era and how civilians concealed carry daggers in the public for self-defense. You know, about three Americas ago. And then it took this other weird detour into talking about how the introduction of black powder handguns in Tudor England and talking about how King Henry VIII was regulating them. Because if there was one group that the founding fathers would love for us to be looking for when it comes to rights, it would probably be the British monarchy. See, Thomas, in his justification, brushed off these pre-colonial royal regulations as not relevant. Not because they were pre-colonial royal regulations, but because they were not based on public safety and instead were about wanting people to retain proficiency in longbows. Now, it was at this point when I kind of looked at the decision a bit and said, What, what the heck am I reading? I, I mean, thanks for the pages on top of pages of Dark Age weaponry regulation, but can we get to the part about where the Second Amendment and some sort of self-defense right in the United States come up? What Clarence Thomas was trying to do there was paint a long and uninterrupted picture of citizens having the freedom to carry guns in public for the purposes of nothing but self-defense up until the point where New York passed that pesky little gun law saying, Alright, you need a gun for self-defense, and just over a hundred years ago. Now, as you can imagine, gun regulation wasn't really at the top of the list of priorities during the Wild West and colonial periods. Still, a lot of historians are taking aim at Thomas's interpretation, saying it's very much cherry-picking. Most prominently, take for example the post-Civil War South. Now, unsurprisingly, there were plenty of regulations being put on publicly carrying guns in the occupied southern states that would be inconsistent with Thomas's interpretation of an untarnished, no public gun carry regulatory history. Now, he wrote off these regulations as well as a few others by saying, "All right, all right." We acknowledge that the Texas cases support New York's proper cause requirement, which can analogize to Texas's reasonable ground standard. But the Texas statutes and the rationales set forth in English and Duke are outliers. In fact, only one other state, West Virginia, adopted a similar public carry statute before 1900. Yeah, see, Texas was a one-off. Well, then you got West Virginia, so it was a two-off. And this New York law was passed just over 1900, so it's a three-off. Are there more examples? Oh, wait, six states currently have these laws? Okay, so six off. All outliers. I have six votes from my side, so my version of history stands. In this somewhat confusing ruling, the new standard for when a public carry law is constitutional is whether it's been historically a mainstream thing or not. Really emphasis on that mainstream part, because if a few hipster states are doing it and maybe the eastern corner or the southwestern corner of the country, outliers. In his decision, what Thomas really did was throw out a bit of that 2008 Heller decision's test that was based on the text of the Second Amendment and instead take things one step further. As the court decision says, the new framework is broadly consistent with Heller, which demands a test rooted in the Second Amendment's text, as informed by history. But Heller does not support applying means and scrutiny in the Second Amendment context. Instead, now we're going to change this a bit, the government must affirmatively prove that its firearms regulation is a part of the historical tradition that delineates the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. So phew, we are no longer going to have to sit around while English teachers are debating about clauses and wake me up in 20 minutes. Instead, we're going to now have historians arguing about whether or not it was mainstream for the government to do or not do something and hope that the judges agree with their view on history. Oh man, the next generation of gun cases are going to be really confusing. <clears throat> Well, you see, this medieval text shows that people were bringing knives onto carriages. <clears throat> yeah, well, the first British steam engine did allow blow darts. 
So I guess you can't ban AR-15s on public subways. Next case, please. Now with this new history first interpretation, Thomas recognized that Americans do have a right to carry guns in public. And no, not bows and daggers, the fun ones. At the same time, he also did leave a lot of gray areas for specific zones, like for example regulations governing government buildings, stadiums, schools, and subways. Future courts and states are going to have to iron out exactly how far regulations can go in public places based on this new historical standard. And yes, it will all be based on this new historical standard, a huge part of the complaint Breyer had in his dissent. He wrote, the court's near exclusive reliance on history is not only unnecessary, but it is deeply impractical. It imposes a task on the lower court that judges cannot easily accomplish. Judges understand how to weigh a law's objectives, its ends, against the methods used to achieve those objectives, its means, but judges are far less accustomed to resolving difficult to answer historical questions. Courts are, after all, staffed by lawyers and not historians. So that's pretty much what just happened. Cliff notes of this episode, it's now illegal for states to require justification beyond just self-defense to issue a public carry permit to the people, because we have a right to publicly carry for the purposes of self-defense. That is, as long as you still dot all your I's and cross all your T's in the application process. Those I's and T's can still include things like required training, no criminal history, and everything else you'd sort of come to expect. No more interesting what's changed is how these laws are evaluated, because public carry was allowed to this list of rights not so much because of the text of the Second Amendment, but more because of the historical tradition of common law English law and colonial America, a new standard that's going to be dictating all future gun rights cases. Now, interestingly enough, a similar standard was just used to overrule Roe v. Wade when the justices pointed to a long history of states regulating abortions to the point where they decided to ban all abortion regulations, and you can read more about that decision right over here. That video is my coverage of the leaked draft opinion, but it's basically the same thing as the final decision, so I'll round up a bit. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Now before I go, YouTube hates it when I talk about guns, abortion, or other constitutional rights, even though I go out of my way to present the information in the least offensive way possible. If you like this video and think that it provides some information that might be valuable to people, I want to give this link up here a quick share. It will not be recommended organically for viewership. Thank you, and that's actually all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, why don't you join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.